Okay, I'm just starting live streaming to our HISC YouTube page. Okay, right on, let's get started. So welcome everybody. Again, we're in our first week of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. So thank you for joining us. And if this is your first uh, webinar for the month, welcome. And my face, and if it's not, <laughs> my face is probably familiar by now. So I'm Chelsea, I'm with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. Um, today, we are joined by Ryan Theroy and Flint Hughes, who are going to talk about fence lines, ungulates, and rapid ohia death. Um, just real quick, Flint Hughes, he's a research ecologist with USDA Forest Service. He has been working in Hawaii for over 20 years at the Institute of Pacific Islands Forestry, and during that time has investigated interactions between native and non-native plants, forest succession, forest nutrient dynamics, and forest carbon sequestration, as well as rapid ohia death. Uh, Flint has earned a BA and a master's degree from Stanford University and a PhD in forest science from Oregon State University investigating ecosystem scale dynamics, dynamics and impacts of deforestation and land use in the rainforest of the Brazilian Amazon and southern Mexico. So we're really happy to have him here and especially here working uh, in Hawaii on, you know, a really uh, challenging problem of rapid hohia death. We also have Ryan Feroy. He is the chair and associate professor in the, at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, Department of Geography and Environmental Science. And he's the director of the University of Hawaii Hilo Spatial Data Analysis and Visualization Research Laboratory. He completed his graduate studies in geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has an undergraduate degree in physics from the College of William and Mary in Virginia, where he was was captain of the badminton team. Oh, yeah, right on. Yeah. I hope that has followed you <laughs> into your life in Hawaii. Um, prior to joining the faculty at UH Hilo, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Earth Science at the University of Wisconsin. So we are so glad to have you both here um, and helping our audience understand what is happening in these dynamic places up in our forest with rapid ohia death and understanding fence lines and ungulates and how they interact together. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ryan to share his screen and get us started. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Chelsea. Let me try to share my screen here and go ahead and, and, and get started. Yeah, again, it's a pleasure um, uh, being here with, with you all. And um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit. And then, yeah, Flint, Flint will uh, chime in. Uh, with with um, all the great work that that his group is is doing, um, I uh, just real quick, um, I'm I'm talking to you all from uh, Hawaii Island. I believe uh, Flint is also on the island, but I'm uh, over on the the east side. Actually, I'm here at the UH Hilo uh, campus. All those beautiful orange uh, rooftops you can see there. I hope um, uh, it's a gorgeous day here. Sun is shining. It's been actually pretty dry. Um, if anybody's interested in getting a degree at UH Hilo, we're always looking for good students. You can go scuba diving. You can do all kinds of good things. Uh, as Chelsea mentioned, I'm the chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science and uh, a lot of outdoor uh, activities. This is all pre-COVID photos. We mask up uh, currently. And um, we also have a master's program in tropical conservation, biology, and environmental science. I also run the SF lab, as mentioned, and our mission is to apply geospatial tools uh, to environmental problems of local significance. And we work on a lot of different projects from emergency response for lava flows um, to agroforestry in the Marshall Islands, but a project that's been taking up a lot of our attention and uh, uh, time has been associated with um, rapid ohia death. And so this is a, a photo I'm sharing that was uh, taken from a drone um, and it's um, showing uh, a number of uh, uh, trees expressing visible symptoms, a characteristic of infection by the fungal pathogens responsible for rapid ohia death. Um, my assumption is that, that most folks on this talk already have kind of a working knowledge of 
of rapid ohia death and the you know the pathogens associated with it. So I'm not going to get too much into that. If if there are questions about that, we could we could certainly um, uh, try to address some of those. But I'm going to be mostly focusing on you know some of the work that we've been doing, looking at differences in ohia mortality in areas that are uh, fenced and unfenced. Um, and uh, thinking about the role that ungulates may play in sort of accelerated mortality that we see in some of our, our, our native uh, ohia forests. So that's kind of the focus that I'll be uh, working on. I should also make the point that from the air, we can identify trees that we suspect um, uh, have been infected with the fungal pathogens responsible for rapid ohia death. But until there's a, um, a physical sample collected and run through the lab, um, uh, we can have confidence, but we can't have that 100% confirmation until the, the lab actually uh, tests those. But the, in the areas that I'll be sharing, there's been a lot of trees tested. And, and so definitely the fungal pathogens are present in these areas. Not every single tree that I'll show has been tested, but a, a large portion of them. And uh, in general, the uh, vast majority of them have come back positive for uh, the fungal pathogens. But again, from the air, you, you can't know 100%. You need that you need that sample. Um, I'll be showing a series of maps and uh, the dots and the colors of the dots represent trees we've identified from the imagery that we have, you know, we think that we have suspicion that they've been infected. And when they're yellow colored, that's kind of low confidence based on some criteria we use. And then when you get up to, to red, that's sort of high confidence. And so this, these are some images from the La Pohoihoi Forest Reserve. Uh, an area that we've been imaging for uh, quite some time. Um, and uh, we've seen an increase over time in, in trees uh, expressing these symptoms and, and the trees die. Um, so if the trees express, generally they're on their way of, 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 of dying. Uh, we started out doing this with, with drones and we're uh, getting really great imagery, um, but only able to cover you know, 100 acres or so um, after working quite quite hard, and so we've we've now scaled up, and we're using satellite imagery. Um, but most of the the data I'll be sharing is is coming from a uh, helicopter uh, uh, acquired imagery. And so what you're seeing here is you know these little outlined areas is is, is you know drone images and and suspect trees from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and then we started using the helicopter, and we can cover a much larger area and um, what you see in this map with these checks, these are places that trees have been actually sampled based on coordinates we provide to Flint's groups and others who go out and actually sample. Um, and then if, the, if they come back positive, they get a check. If they come back non-detect, um, they get kind of a, 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 an X or, or such. And the vast majority of the trees in, in these areas that we've identified have indeed come back positive for the fungal, the fungal pathogens. This is with uh, David Okita, the helicopter uh, we use. Um, this is the rig. We have an array of cameras we put on there. And this is developed in collaboration with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and Volcano Helicopters and r, &R Welding um, here in Hilo. Um, I'm going to show a couple different maps. And, I'm gonna uh, uh, and then one graph, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Flint. Um, this first site is within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, the Ola'a unit. And, um, and the area outlined in, in sort of the teal color is an area that we um, imaged back in January of 2019. The green lines are areas, are fence lines, right? So inside those green boxes, those are areas as of, you know, January of 2019, which were, uh, had coherent fence lines, which, and were generally, you know, uh, pretty free of ungulates. And if you look at the density of dots here, you can see in the unfenced area, Right to the sort of you know southeast, you can see a lot of dots, but inside the fenced area, very few. There's maybe four dots. Um, we imaged this area again about a year and a half later, and unfortunately, we saw, and that's what you're seeing this 820 image. You're seeing we saw a lot, a lot, a lot of you know trees expressing symptoms and dying inside an area which back in 2019 had had very few. And the difference was um, between those two time periods, the fence line had been um, compromised and uh, feral ungulates had gotten into that area. And um, we know that feral ungulates can damage uh, trees um, by bark stripping and other behaviors. 
And those trees, uh, those, those openings, those wounds are, are uh, ways for the fungal pathogen to get into the trees. Um, and so this was a, a clear case of, you know, a fence line breach. And then following the breach, we saw an uh, area which had very little mortality prior to the breach, unfortunately having a big explosion of mortality afterwards. Um, and again, many of those uh, uh, trees were, were sampled and um, uh, generally all the high confidence trees that we identified did come back positive for fungal pathogens. I'm gonna show one other area. This is down in, in Kahuku, again, um, part of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And uh, this is another map, it's slightly different. In this case, the purple lines uh, uh, represent the fence lines. The, the purple dots are you know, photos that we took from the helicopter survey. Um, but you can see um, basically on the, the east side, the unfenced side, a very high density of trees dying, but then within the, the park unit, within the fenced, uh, generally ungulate free area, a much, much lower density of of, of trees expressing symptoms. Um, and and th this last plot I'm, I'm showing um, uh, tries to show this in a, in, a, in, a, in a graphical way. So these are bar charts. The green ones are for uh, the fenced portions of these different study sites. The four study sites shown are LFR, Lapoi Forest Reserve, the, the Koa unit in Ola Forest Reserve, Kahuku and Thurston. And then when there's multiple sets of bars, that's because we imaged it multiple times. So again, the green are the fenced in areas and the orange are the unfenced um, sort of neighboring areas for each of these sites. And the mortality levels range from in the unfenced areas about two times higher in Lapoy Forest Reserve up to about 69 times higher, 69 times more mortality in the Kahuku um, area that I just showed um, in the unfenced versus the fenced. And the lone exception of this is in the Ola unit in the, the um, August 2020, and that's after the fence line breach, where we saw actually more mortality inside the fenced area with the ungulates than in the, the, the formerly unfenced area. So, um, yeah, we see a big difference in, in, in Ohia mortality in places which have been fenced and don't have ungulates in them uh, versus places which are unfenced and do have ungulates. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I'll turn it over to to Flint. Oh, right on. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, that's, that's such a good description of, of your work and, and your description of, of your lab and UH Hilo. I, I wish I was a student. I'd want to, I'd want to apply to work with you. That'd be fun. Um, I, I, um, yeah, I, as, as, as I was introduced, I'm, I'm, my name is Flint Hughes. I'm a research ecologist. Uh, at the Institute for Pacific Islands Forestry. It's a, that's a research institute of the Forest Service in, that's located in Hilo, just up the hill from UH. And um, yeah, uh, it's been, boy, the Institute has been around for 50, 70 years, something like that, um, uh, doing various work related to forestry and forest science um, over those years. And today, most of what we do is related to conservation of, of native, native ecosystems, both in Hawaii and across the Pacific. Um, and, and so there's oh, maybe half a dozen research scientists and, and staff um, that, that work at the Institute and everybody um, is doing great work up there, figuring out um, answers to questions and solutions to problems as best we can with, with our with our research efforts. Um, yeah, so, so that's just a little bit about, about where I work. Um, and I, I've, I've really appreciated collaborating with, with Ryan on rapid Ohia death issues because he's given us um, so much information to learn from about the patterns and the dynamics of, of the spread of rod across landscapes kind of where it's occurring um what what's the extent of 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 an outbreak and then and then as he's saying with this work trying to provide information about why it's occurring um and and what start, uh and getting it kind of what the causal mechanisms are so so ryan looks at things from the air kind of the bird's eye view 
Um, the work I'm going to be describing um, this morning is is very much not the bird's eye view. It's more <laughs> like the, I guess it's more like the pig's eye view. Um, the sampling that I'll be describing is, you know, at the soil level, um, the the group, our our group that. Um, is investigating this as a collection from folks in my lab. Uh, our little acronym is RUF, uh, Rod, Ungulates, and Fence Lines. That's the, that's the study. So, so we go by roughsters, we go by the ruffians, um, but we are definitely on the ground and, and exploring um, what's going on in terms of the interactions between management, ungulates, and the spread of ceratocystis. Um, the, the way we do that is, is we're looking primarily and focusing in on, on the presence of a knock of, of ceratocystis. So that's the causal agent of rapidohia death, ceratocystis fungi spores or inoculum in the soils, because our, our thinking is that in areas that, um, have inoculum in the soils, um, from that's getting deposited either from trees in the local environment or or wind dispersed trees is somehow getting picked up and moved around and into trees through wounds um rapido heat death is a, a ceratocystis is a, a wound pathogen so it needs to have a wound to get into a tree if a tree is not wounded uh the the pathogen has no matter how much is around in the environment it's not going to get in the tree and infect it and subsequently kill it so um wounding is a, is a utterly important part of the of the process and some of the agents that wound trees unfortunately are ungulates in in the environment and, and pigs certainly do that not not necessarily trunks they don't necessarily wound trunks sometimes they do but more often they're they're wounding roots um, and so we think that the pathogens, the inoculum from psoriasis is getting into to roots through wounds created by ungulates, um, specifically pigs in, in the cases I'll be talking about today. Um, so that's kind of the, conne the connection, the mechanism that we're exploring. Um, and, and the simple question is, well, are, is there inoculum in, in the soils uh, in these areas? to be spread around, to be picked up by ungulates, and are there ungulates in these areas as well? So, so what we set up is a study to, to look at the impact of ungulates, the interactions of ungulates with ceratocystis in areas where we had a lot of ungulate activity and then adjacent fenced areas, managed areas, where ungulates had been excluded. And so what we set up, and I'm sorry I don't have any slides, I'm, I'm a little bit too remote to be showing slides today, um, uh, what we selected were about six or seven study regions across the Big Island that includes areas in Kohala, uh, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, Kilauea, um, down in Pau on Mauna Loa substrate. Uh, so a wide variety of environments where we had the opportunity to, to have these this kind of experimental setup of adjacent or uh, fenced areas where pigs were pigs and ungu other ungulates were excluded, um, next next to or adjacent to uh, unfenced areas where ungulates were quite present and quite active. Um, and so I, I'm just going to uh, talk about a few results, and some of them overlap with with the images that Ryan showed. Um, what we, what we do in in each of these sites, we we sample within a hectare and we sample 25 soil points uh, 25 sample points within that hectare kind of distributed across we we think that gives us a pretty good idea about the presence uh or absence of inoculum in the soils and and i i it, i could take a couple hours describing the um the process that we go through to actually analyze uh process and analyze those samples to get a a, a definitive answer about whether there's inoculum in the soils or not. Um, uh, one of one of the members of the team, Gabby Benito, Gabriela Benito, has been just uh, determined and unstoppable in developing the methods that we now use. Um, and it was a lot of work, and she's done a fantastic job. Um, and and all of the results that I'll be talking about now 
um, are based on her hard work to, to develop these, these methods that really work and, and that we can be confident about. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a, f- a few areas uh, that we have data for. We're in kind of the, in the midst of this effort. And so these results, um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about our final for these areas, but the whole picture is kind of still revealing itself to us. We're, we've sampled about a third of the plots of the, of the hectares that we plan to across these areas. And so we have a long way to go, but I just wanted to share some of these results initially so you get an idea about what we're seeing. Um, so the first area I'm going to talk about is um, uh, two pu'u's up in Kohala, one pu'u u'au, um, that is an unfenced area. It was the, the, it was the, it's the location of the original outbreak of, of rod in, in Kohala. And um, it's, Ceratosis has had a devastating effect in this, in this local region on this, on this pu'u. It's killed probably close to 90% of the ohia trees in that area. Um, in contrast, about a quarter mile away, we have a fenced area um, that's um, called Pu'u Pili. It's been fenced for, oh, decades. Uh, it's, the fences are not completely um, uh, impenetrable, I guess I, I should say, to ungulates. And I'll, I'll get to, to that in a little bit. But, um, but those are, that's our comparison in Kohala. And what we found with our sampling in, on Pu'u Ua'u in particular first, um, we found that of the 25 samples that we collected across the hectare, um, again, a good sample uh, at the landscape scale, uh, 90, 96% of those samples came back positive for inoculum of ceratocystis. Um, and in that site, we, we not only are seeing high levels of inoculum in the soil, we're also seeing a lot of evidence of pig activity. It's everywhere, um, vegetation damage, soil damage, fecal matter everywhere. Across this area, and we're also seeing, as I said, a large number of, of trees that are have either, either succumbed already to ceratocystis um, or are in the process of dying. Um, so, high amounts of ungulate activity, high amounts of inoculum in the soil, um, and high amounts of mortality. Pupili, um, in contrast, we we anticipated that because it's fenced, we haven't seen a lot of mortality across the site. I don't. I think. I don't think we've seen any mortality within the fence. We've seen some mortality just outside the fence line. Um, We anticipated seeing little or no inoculum in those soils. But when we went to sample that area, we noticed that that actually there had been a fair bit of ungulate ingress into the area that we were sampling. Um, And that manifested as um, in our soil samples, as revealing about 50%, well, 56% of, of the samples came back positive for ceratocystis inoculum. So even though it's fenced, there were ungulates in there, we have not seen the mortality um, occurring at anywhere, anywhere remotely close to what we're seeing in Puau, but we're worried that because there's a lot of inoculum, in the soils and because there is an ungulate activity that we're going to start to see that occurring um, through increased wounding of those trees as the ungulates move, move around in that forest um, and, and start wounding those trees and, and having them become infected with ceratocystis as a result. So, so that's Kohala, that's just some contrast between those two sites. Um, I, I wanna jump over to, um, to Ola'a, the area that Ryan was talking about. Yes, and I know I'm running out of time. (laughs) Yeah, just like 30 seconds, because I do want to open it up for there's a question and and for us to add questions. Perfect. Perfect. So so, um, just really quickly, uh, the the samples that we've we've run so far, we've collected from Ola'a small track, which is that area that was not did not have a lot of mortality because it's well fenced and well protected. That area uh, exhibited 4% of, of inoculum positivity across those plots. And then the COA unit, where that, that scenario that Ryan described, where we had ingress, it was nice and clean, not a lot of 
mortality, and then there was ingress by ungulates, and he saw an increase in mortality. Our soil sampling in that area um, manifest, uh, revealed a positivity rate of, or uh, positivity level of 16%. So about four times more um, inoculum in those soils compared to the much better protected Ola'a small tract. So, so that just gives you some contrast and, and some a bit of information about what we're doing with this project. And I'd, I'd love to answer questions if you guys have any about what we're doing, how we're doing, and what we're learning. So thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Flint. That was, I mean, we could have had a whole webinar for you describing the, the soil and inoculum in there. It was really interesting to hear about that. And thank you so much, Ryan, for providing like the aerial perspective and what's happening. Um, we are down to a few minutes. Uh, we do have one question <laughs> and it's a big one. Um, and this is from Monty. Is it too simplistic of an outlook for me to conclude that rod will lead to Ohia eventually becoming completely extirpated from unfenced areas, but that Ohia will persist in perpetuity without much trouble inside fenced areas? Um, and I think Flint and Ryan, you both could talk to that question. You want to you want to go ahead first, Ryan? Um, uh, sure, I'll, I, I can briefly uh, um, uh, talk about that, but I think Flint, you could probably provide a, a, a deeper answer than I could. Um, you know, there's at least, certainly on a Hawaii island, right? There's a lot of ohia trees, right? There's a lot of ohia trees that are still healthy, and um, and I know that these maps I show can be quite alarming. Ah, the whole area, oh my goodness. Um, uh, but the, the truth is that even in uh, many of these, you know, unfenced areas, um, there, are, there are large, large tracts of, of, of healthy ohia. Um, and there's some really exciting work by, you know, um, Blaine Louise and others looking at, you know, resistance and other things of, of different ohia varieties and such. So I... Um, I don't think it's the case that in all unfenced areas, we're going to lose all of our heo trees. I, I don't believe that's going to, to happen. I will say that in unfenced areas, our ohia trees are under increasing threat and pressure, and they're really being stressed from invasive species, from all kinds of other things. And so, um, in some areas, we are losing all the ohia, like in lowland areas, um, yeah, the, the ohia that you see are, you know, they're not in 50 years, there probably won't be any. So um, so I, 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 I don't think we're going to lose all ohia in unfenced areas, but I, I definitely think that the unfenced areas, the ohia trees there are, are feeling a lot of pressure and it's not good and it's not a good trajectory, I, but I don't think we're gonna lose all of them. Yeah. And I, I, I'd concur with Ryan for sure on that. And I um, just would add, I, I guess I'd look at it a different way. Um, you know, when we started this research, we were tasked with trying to figure out management approaches that would protect Ohia to the best extent possible. And it's turned out that protecting forests through fencing, which is a, you know, it's not a high tech solution. It's, it's not an easy effort by any means and it takes management, it takes effort, um, but it's not like a space age approach. That practical management approach works to protect trees from rapid ohia death. Um, and it's, it really boils down to a basic of you're protecting trees from chronic wounding from ungulates. And that we were learning is a big factor in spreading the disease, infecting, wounding trees and infecting them and subsequently killing them. So, so I certainly there are, as, as Ryan said, there are areas, um, Saddle Road, the forests along Saddle Road, for instance, that are not fenced. There are millions of trees out there that have not succumbed to, to serratocystis and well, arguably are pretty well protected perhaps because there isn't a lot of ungulate pressure in those forests. Um, that's, that's, a, that's conjecture. That's not, that's not something we know yet. Um, but certainly we are losing ohia trees. 
And if we don't apply the best management practices we can, we're going to lose more and more and more over time, not to the point of extinction uh, or even local extirpation, but we are going to lose that fabric of native dominance of that, the, the, the habitat that Ohia provides. Um, Ohia could likely become a much less dominant component of this, of these systems. Um, and that's something that we don't want to see happen. I hope that, I hope that answers your question, Monty. And, and I'll just, I'll just add to that, that, you know, that uh, I think we're talking about Hawaii Island, right? And in right. the case that we've got millions and millions of Ohia trees on Hawaii Island, Kauai, Oahu, you know, that's a different story. Right. right. And, and so, so, um, yeah. And I, I guess too, uh, I have to say, I, I, every Ohia tree is a, an important individual. Um, and we tend to think of these as forests, but I, I think it's worth thinking about Ohia, single Ohia trees for their own value. And for, and some of these trees are, you know, 300, 400 years old. Um, pretty amazing creatures. And so we should respect that and them and do what we can to protect them. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for ending on that note of hope and, and also just being representatives of this larger collective of researchers, cultural practitioners, land managers, just people, communities that are really working to answer these questions. And I mean, we're answering questions every day and learning more and more about how to manage this fungal pathogen. And that information is feeding into, and the technologies like you're developing, Ryan, and the science that you're doing, Flint, I mean, those are feeding into other invasive species managements. Um, so it's really uh, you guys just do great work and we're so thankful for you and like this larger collective of the Rapid Ohia Death Working Group and for our audience for wanting to learn more about this topic. Um, we are a little over time, but I think that was oh, just a great discussion and I, I'm just happy for the extra minutes we've had together and that people, actually, I feel like we had one more person join, so right on. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, just a heads up for our panelists. When I end the webinar, it just ends it. So it's very abrupt. And I just want to say thank you again um, to Flint and Ryan for joining us today. And you can find out more um, by just, you can just Google Rapid Ohia Death. And there's a great yeah. UH website with a lot of research and all this information. And what you just as a member of the community can do to help um, mitigate the spread. Um, and, and I think Ryan did a great job of just talking, we're talking about Hawaii Island here, but the other islands are in different states, you know, so there's a lot of hope. So yeah. mahalo everybody, thanks for joining uh -huh. us. We have a talk about the legislative process and how you can get involved at 2 p.m. today. So we hope you can join that. Just check out our uh, high SAM schedule for 2022. So thanks again. Awesome, thank oh. you so much. Yeah. Thanks for letting us share, awesome. Take yeah, care. Right on. Thanks Aloha. very much. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Aloha.